Good morning. So I probably should have started this process about five minutes ago. Apologies. Yeah, the only thing is I, I thought we need help getting the screens to, to respond the right way. Okay. Okay, so um, I just want to uh, confirm with the timekeeper, are, are we, we good? Okay, great. So, um, uh, so I'm going to spend about uh, 30 minutes with you, um, and I apologize for that as well. Uh, so, I, uh, I'm, so, so Dave, Dave asked me to, to provide a, a kind of an overview of the citizen science uh, landscape. Um, I'm not sure that I have any uh, sort of unique view into, um, into ELSI, uh, but I'm hoping that um, along the way um, I can raise a few issues uh, that might be related to ELSI to just kind of get us uh, primed for uh, further presentations and, and discussions. So after, um, after that presentation, we'll do a brief uh, activity. And, uh, and then uh, if there are any questions, we can, we can talk about it. So just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Pietro Michelucci. Uh, I'm a cognitive scientist. Um, and uh, you know, frankly, my, my bio is probably in some of the materials here, so I won't belabor that. Um, but I'm quite pleased to be here. And, uh, and I also uh, I'm grateful to the organizers for putting this together, uh, and also to the NIH leadership for uh, supporting these activities, which I think are very uh, forward uh, looking. Um, so, so basically, um, there's a lot of material. I'm going to go through it. It's going to be like hyperdrive. So, I hope um, you've uh, had some coffee. Um, so, we're going to talk about what we're talking about. What is citizen science? How does it relate to some of these other constructs? And I thought Jennifer did an outstanding job of, of initiating that that discussion. Uh, why do we actually need humans in the loop? I think. It's kind of important to think about why we need humans, um, because that in some ways helps inform the way in which humans participate in citizen science, which um, helps inform discussion about uh, our expectations and issues related to ELSI. Um, why is now a good time to be having this conversation? Uh, and then uh, uh, going to survey the landscape and, uh, and then um, have a little activity. Uh, hopefully, we have time. So um, I, I begin most of my presentations with this. Uh, um, this is uh, sort of a cornerstone of my personal philosophy and why I care about uh, the space of human computation and citizen science. Uh, the the Haudenosaunee um, uh, have the great law that in every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. And I think uh, that. Um, that this, uh, this workshop is very much in that spirit, that we're, we're um, looking closely at a technology and considering um, all the implications and possible uh, impact of that technology. So, um, so the reason I care about this is because uh, I believe that because of technology and uh, because of the, the large population of humans on the planet, that collectively we've created a lot of problems. And, uh, and so I'm interested in how we might be able to um, solve them together. So I'll start by talking about uh, human computation as a context for citizen science, and it helps to ground some of these other concepts. Um, so, um, so of course, with most things, it depends on who you ask. Um, if you ask a, a, an HCI person, then human computation is an HCI problem. Uh, if you ask a psychologist, it's a behavioral problem. And if you ask a computer scientist, it's an AI problem, of course. Um, and and it's, it's probably all of these things and, and other things as well. Um, so uh, at a recent uh, workshop in June where we assembled to talk about human computation, we did an activity um, to uh, brainstorm 
what sorts of concepts um, were related to human computation, and, and uh, this is a tag cloud that, uh, that, that sort of arose from, from that exercise as a summary of, of that exercise. Uh, so um, to think about what human computation is, we have to think about what we mean by computation and how this has evolved over time. So we used to think about computation in terms of, of doing a pencil and paper computation on a napkin. Uh, what's uh, this number divided by this number? Um, and then uh, with the advent of computing machines, um, then algorithms, processes of uh, calculations um, became uh, uh, a way of, of computing. Um, and then as we became more sophisticated, then we started to think of symbolic reasoning and pattern recognition by computing machines as representing computation. And, uh, and now more recently, as we bring humans into the loop and we think about humans doing some of the computing, then uh, uh, very um, abstract kinds of reasoning, uh, such as creativity, intuition, and synthesis are now thought of as computation. So um, one way to think about all of these things is more generally as information processing. Um, but when we think about human computation, um, we tend to, to um, tend to mean lots of people working together in some kind of a distributed network. And this can be technology agnostic or technology mediated. And, and for the most part nowadays, we, we think about this in the context of the internet. Um, so in terms of trying to figure out how the various concepts interrelate, um, the community came together to, to create a handbook um, a little over a year ago. And, um, and in the course of producing that handbook, we had lots of discussions about, well, what do we mean by all these things? And it was like the blind men and the elephant, where uh, we had uh, 20 different disciplines represented in the handbook. But eventually, we coalesced on a, on a few key concepts and had some agreement on those. So I'll share that agreement with you. So by human computation, we mean the design and analysis of multi-agent information processing systems in which humans participate as computational elements. So that's just to say that you have um, a, a network of machines and humans that are both engaged in computation um, in complementary fashion. By crowdsourcing, we mean the distribution of tasks to a large group of individuals via flexible open call in which individuals work at their own pace until the task is completed. Collective intelligence refers to a group's ability to solve problems and the process by which this occurs. And social computing refers to information processing that occurs as a consequence of human social interaction, usually assumed to occur in an online medium. So um, this, this, is a, this is a collection of definitions. It's not the last word on these, I'm sure. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a place to begin the discussion. So what about citizen science more specifically? Um, so the Citizen Science Association says that citizen science is public participation in scientific research. Seems reasonable, but it doesn't say anything about that having to happen in the context of the internet or, or in some sort of uh, uh, techno-social medium. Uh, cyber science has been used to refer to the use of the internet to conduct some aspect of science, but it doesn't say anything about the public's um, participation in the scientific research. And then finally, citizen cyber science would be citizen science through the internet. Often when we talk about citizen science, I think we, we tend to mean that. Um, and as Jennifer pointed out, these are evolving concepts and definitions. But this is at least a way to nail down some terms and have a conversation about it. Um, so uh, there are more detailed taxonomies emerging, in fact. And uh, in the latest issue of the journal Human Computation, uh, Greg Newman was a special editor for a special issue on citizen science. And um, in his own contribution to that issue, uh, he put together a very nice uh, synthesis of these concepts and, uh, and a conceptual taxonomy. Uh, this is um, available open access online, and I would encourage you, if you're interested, to, to look at this. Um, and then uh, also hot off the press, um, 
Andrea Wiggins and Kevin Crowston. Andrea, who's sitting next to me at the table here, uh, was, uh, was an author on this, uh, produced this beautiful survey. It's the kind of survey that everybody wants but nobody's willing to do, uh, but they actually did it for us. And uh, it examines uh, 77 citizen science projects um, and then tracks uh, two new projects closely in the context of uh, a number of different uh, survey dimensions. Um, so I encourage you to look at that too, and I think that's also open access online. Um, so um, how do we get humans and machines to work together effectively? So machines um, do certain things very well, and humans do certain things very well, and there's certainly some overlap, but they tend to be quite complementary, which is why this is a recipe for success. So machines do things like counting, uh, calculation, they remember things certainly much better than I do, and uh, execute processes reliably. And then uh, humans tend to do things like inference, um, some better than others, uh, visual perception, linguistic ability, um, abstraction of concepts, uh, they embody world knowledge, have social cultural awareness, and are creative. So you could sort of imagine a continuum of these abilities. And over time, as machines become more sophisticated, that machines begin to compete with humans on these dimensions as they already have. And so um, we would hope that humans would in some ways retain an advantage in some of these things even as we move far into the future. But one implication of this is that human cat labor categories will increasingly narrow. Uh, just as the Industrial Revolution automated um, the assembly lines, we're going to see other kinds of automation. Um, so, uh, so there will be fewer things that humans bring to the table. So this uh, potentially raises some labor issues. And um, Alec Felsteiner, who I believe is a lawyer at the Department of Labor, wrote a nice chapter in the Handbook of Human Computation um, about labor standards in human computation. And, um, and so um, I, I, this is, uh, these are completely based on his ideas as applied to citizen science. So we can ask questions like, where does citizen science intersect with traditional notions of employment? Which labor standards ought to apply? Are there work versus non-work forms of citizen science participation? How does one determine jurisdiction coverage and compensation in an online context? I think to a lawyer, those words have very specific meanings which I don't completely understand. How do we determine thresholds of fairness, transparency, and, and dignity? And who is the regulatory uh, authority in all of this? OK, so um, why is the, oh, and can I just do a quick time check? Okay. 20 minutes left? Or tw left, OK, <laughs> thanks. Um, so it's like time compression when you're doing a presentation. So, so why is the timing good right now? So this is just, uh, I'll go through these quite quickly. It's just to say there's a lot of activity in this space and it's heating up. So um, we had the NSF um, SOX program, uh, which intended to understand the properties of systems of people and computers um, working together. And then this was uh, followed by the Cyber Human Systems program, also at NSF um, in IIS. Uh, where uh, they're fleshing out sort of the space of uh, configurations of humans and machines and also with the third dimension of the environment. Uh, we had the HCOMP conference uh, in November. Uh, collective intelligence has become an annual event. Uh, there are relevant social comm events. Uh, we have a, a special technical community in human computation uh, through IEEE. We had the recent handbook. We have a new journal. Um, the new Citizen Science Association with, with um, a, a quite large membership. Someone in this room probably knows. It's, I think it's at least 1,000, if not more, global members who signed on almost instantly uh, when, um, when it opened up. And, uh, and the CSA uh, will have a forthcoming journal called Citizen Science Theory and Practice, which will be a great way for both um, citizen science participants and scientists to communicate uh, with each other. Um, there's also the PCAST recommendation requested um, 
a subcommittee of NIDR to uh, do cross-agency development in social computing. Um, and, um, and then in June, we had, uh, uh, we, we convened for a human computation roadmap summit. Um, uh, one of the co-organizers here, uh, Leah Shanley, uh, was instrumental in, in developing that. And uh, the point of this summit was to put together a research roadmap. That is to say, what's the fundamental research that gives rise to which capabilities, that gives rise to which kinds of um, uh, 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 opportunities to address societal uh, issues. And um, so, so we're putting together a workshop report about that. And we hope to take that to, to policymakers and, um, and use that in support of a, a new national initiative in human computation, analogous to what exists today for robotics. I think there are a lot of hidden click-throughs here. Okay, um, so uh, and so now kind of the um, the lay of the land, and forgive me, a lot of this will be quite familiar to many of you. Um, so the way that I sort of uh, I was trying to think of a way to break this down, um, when you're thinking about citizen science and how people access it online, there are portals that allow you to search, manage. Uh, search for new citizen science projects, uh, manage your own and track your own activity in those. Um, there are citizen science platforms that are host to many different projects and allow people to create their own projects. And then the specific pro projects themselves and the various engagement modalities for public participation in scientific pursuits. Um, I'll also mention uh, briefly the notion of building on, on past success and, and how that could be one way to have some assurances about future successes. So um, a, a canonical kind of example for a portal is SciStarter.com. Uh, again, I don't know the exact number, but I think there's probably something on the order of 1,000 citizen science projects out there. And uh, maybe it's 800. I don't remember exactly. Uh, but what's nice about SciStarter is that you can, um, you can narrow it down if you're a, a, a public a prospective public participant, you can go on there and say, I'm interested in participating in health and medicine. And, um, and then 77 health and medicine projects come up. And it's just a way to get to those projects. Uh, then we have uh, platforms. And uh, this will be familiar to many of you. Um, Zooniverse is, is associated with lots of uh, space-based projects. Uh, but um, they've expanded the purview, as you can see now, to include humanities, nature, biology, physics, and, um, and they're building lots of tools in to allow folks to create more sophisticated citizen science projects. People who don't have a computer science background or programming background can get in and configure a new, a new research project on their, their flexible platform and then host it there, and then also benefit from the huge pool of participants. SitSci.org is another one. This is tailored more to environmental projects, but it, it gives users a set of tools to create citizen science projects. And in this case, I think um, uh, folks who do not necessarily have a scientific background are encouraged to create projects of their own. Um, and then the tools help them to build projects that tend to conform more to the scientific process. So I think you know one question that arises is when you start to allow the public to engage in citizen science in terms of creating new projects, how do we ensure that um, that those are that that the the process they follow is a scientific process and and the the results can be trusted. Um, so we'll look at a few categories of projects: um, research acceleration, um, scientific discovery, and what I'm calling virtuous ecosystems. Ooh. So research acceleration. Um, so in 2002, uh, we sent a, a probe into space to collect some dust from. Comet uh, VILT-2. And, uh, and so there's this uh, aerogel um, collector grid, which is this, uh, the, the least dense substance known to humankind. And these particles traveling at 14 miles per second would slow down in the aerogel enough to actually become trapped in it without destroying the particles. So then um, the spacecraft uh, uh, sent the aerogel sample back down to Earth, landed in Utah in the desert. Um, and, um, and then they looked at this aerogel and they said, how are we going to find these micron-sized particles in the aerogel? 
<clears throat> so um, some of the scientists who are working on this, uh, well, so brief, uh, so does anyone recognize this? Anyone ever put this as a screensaver on their computer? So a few people in the room. You're not dating yourself, don't worry. Um, so, so SETI at home, whoops, um, you know, was the idea of distributed computing. You put a screensaver on your computer, and when your computer's idle, then it is processing data from the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence data set. And if you're the lucky person, maybe someday your computer will be the one to discover signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, but the main idea is that you get a lot of computing power from the idle time of many different computers. So a couple of guys at Berkeley, uh, Andrew Westfall and, and um, David Anderson got together. David Anderson was, uh, um, was the, um, the inventor of the SETI at Home uh, project. And, uh, and they thought, you know, maybe we could apply a similar technique to, uh, to human computation. That is, instead of distributed computing, we could give distributed thinking a try to solve this aerogel problem. And that was the birth of Stardust at Home. So in 2006, and this was sort of a pioneering project in citizen science, they came up with um, an interface that allowed uh, 30,000 internet users to um, learn how to find these dust tracks in the aerogel using a virtual microscope. And by dividing the labor in this way, uh, sorry, my animation isn't working so well. Um, uh, they were ultimately able to, um, to find seven dust particles. And it was, the, I think, the first such dust particles that are believed to be of interstellar origin. Um, so, um, and this was published in Science just this last August. And one thing that's worth noting here is um, among the authors, I don't know if you can read that, 30,714 stardust at home dusters. So. And, and there's a link, and you go online, and you can see the usernames of every single one of those contributors. So this kind of raises another ELSI question, I think. Under what circumstances should public participants be credited? You know, and what are the mechanisms for doing that? This might look familiar to some. This is the iWire project. The idea here is to map the connectome. So how do we create a map of the neurons in the brain so we can better understand how they work? And uh, they're initially um, using retinal neurons. Um, and um, so far, 120,000 participants have developed the skills in using this tool. These are um, members of the public without a scientific background, necessarily. And 120,000 people contributed to a new discovery about how motion detection works in, um, in mammalian uh, retinas. Uh, the cell slider project someone mentioned earlier. Um, the idea is to accelerate, if you have a huge data set of imagery, um, then how do you identify and count cells in the imagery? And so it's divide and conquer again. But then we have another question that arises. Uh, what sort of quality assurance do we have um, when we use a layperson instead of a trained pathologist? There are nuances that only trained pathologists can detect. Um, and, uh, and so you know they use methods like uh, consensus, you know, if, if, or if nine out of 10 uh, citizen scientists agree that, that this kind of a cell is, is a red blood cell, then we're going to believe that. Um, or we've done studies to show that nine out of 10 citizen scientists are just as reliable as one pathologist. So these are the sorts of questions we want to ask. Malaria spot, I think, is a wonderful idea. Um, this is an app. Download it. If you do, you can help diagnose malaria. The problem is people walk into these malaria clinics, they get their blood drawn, it takes 30 minutes for a specialist to figure out whether or not they have malaria or not. They leave the waiting room, they don't get their diagnosis, they never come back. They might not get treated if they have malaria. A malaria spot allows the imagery to be taken. It's crowdsourced, 10 people look at it. I'm making up the number 10. Some number of people look at, at that one slide. Um, they've gone through some kind of online training and they can get a diagnosis on the spot and then the treatment they need. Um, but again, the question is how good is good enough when it comes to these diagnoses and true positive versus uh, um, uh, false positive or false negative. So uh, can I get a time check? Seven minutes. Okay. 
scientific discovery. We're going to skip through some of this. Um, so there, there are three parts. So, so this is, again, this is another class of citizen science project that has to do with discovery rather than research acceleration. The, the previous examples were all about accelerating research. This is about actually using humans to engage in scientific discovery. So um, I won't belabor the human advantage. I'll say just a few words about it, talk about a few examples of winner-takes-all models of scientific discovery, and then an example of cooperative discovery. So um, one advantage that humans have is what I'm calling selective consideration. And this is the idea that we've evolved to ignore the things that don't matter. And this has been necessary for our survival as a species, as it is for most species. That is, um, all I need to pay attention to is whether or not that thing is going to kill me or whether it's going to be something I can eat. And we've gotten so good at this that when it comes to very abstract sorts of tasks where the potential search space um, is, is enormous, we can quickly eliminate most of the paths that would not be fruitful and focus instead on the ones most likely to be fruitful. And we're so good at this that this allows us to be better than computers at certain kinds of problems most of the time. Um, but there's always the risk when you don't go down some of these different paths that you might miss something. So uh, the cost is that it's not an exhaustive search, but the benefit is that it's a much faster search than computers can do. The other aspect to human advantage that I wanted to talk about, and I won't as much, is serendipitous discovery. And really what I wanted to say is, is how important serendipitous discovery is, historically how important it has been. Um, so um, you recognize this person? Yeah, so, so Donald Rumsfeld is famous for his known knowns. Remember this in the media? The known knowns, we're looking for snakes and expect to sometimes find them under rocks. The known unknowns, we know we may find other animals under rocks, but we aren't sure what they might be. And then the unknown unknowns. It's kind of infamous for this, but if you think about it, this is actually a pretty important idea, and I think it's a worthwhile idea. <laughs> the unknown unknowns are the things we don't know that we don't know. And that's really important. So um, you should never say that if you're a Secretary of Defense. But um, I think we should talk about it. So there are unexpected things we might discover in the course of, up, in the course of uplifting rocks. Okay. And so to put these in, in more scientific terms, the known knowns is the notion that we're able to support or refute a specific hypothesis. The known unknowns is we can generate new related hypotheses based on our findings. and then. Um, the unknown unknowns is the notion that we can make unrelated but useful discoveries. And there's a rich history of doing that. Um, so for example, the discovery of penicillin is an example of that. Um, and so this suggests a continuum between a, um, descriptive analysis and exploratory research. And what I'm going to argue for is, um, so I won't go through, unfortunately, we don't have time, all these examples of serendipitous discovery. but the main idea here is this is why we not only need humans in the loop, um, but we need to create citizen science systems that enable humans to engage in the kind of analysis and reasoning that leads to serendipitous discovery. Um, so, um, and here are some ideas. And again, I apologize. I don't have time to go through all of them now. Um, but I can certainly make the slides available if you're interested. Um, the general idea is that, uh, that we can use citizen science to tackle big data problems. Um, so winner takes all examples. Philo. Here are the ideas, sequence, genetic sequence alignment. I'm not going to say too much about that because I'm in a room full of people who know a lot more about genetics and genomics than I do. I'm not even sure I know the difference between genetics and genomics. Um, but there's value, I guess, in, in discovering alignments in the sense that, that uh, when you have alignment across species, it might signify um, a functional benefit and a place where a mutation could cause more harm than other places. Um, so Jerome Waldespuel and McGill uh, created a gamified task that, um, that allows people to try to um, align these according to rules. And there's a score associated with a certain alignment. You want the colors to line up is basically the idea. But there are, again, rules governing points and things 
where certain alignments are better than others, and sometimes they're not perfect. And it turns out that humans can do better than the best machines at finding these alignments. But the reason this is called a winner takes all is that we're not interested in combining different results from different people playing Philo. We want the single best result that a person comes up with. Um, and this is sort of a crossover project because they developed Open Philo. So it's not just a project, but it's a platform. So others can submit their own uh, sequence data for alignment. Ooh, I've got one minute left. OK, so folded is another example of this, a question that arises under what circumstances can scientific results produced by non-scientists be trusted? We kind of covered that. Nanocrafter. OK, cooperative discovery. Galaxy Zoo is an interesting case study here. Um, because they gave the citizen participants um, the opportunity to engage in discourse through the online medium about the work they were doing. And because of that, um, they were able to share discoveries and ultimately um, uh, converge on a new kind of uh, galaxy called Green Peak Galaxies. Um, so um, virtuous ecosystems. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly mention this one. Uh, patients like me, uh, Sally Okun, did I say your last name right, is here, from Patients Like Me. It's a wonderful idea. Um, the, the virtuous ecosystem allows people to contribute their, their personal health data, to talk about their diseases in a community of people with similar diseases, um, and, um, and look at what treatments have been effective, more or less for other people and then take that information from the aggregate and apply it to their own situation as sort of a, a small experiment, and then report back their own findings. Oh, ibuprofen is working great for chronic fatigue. I'm going to try that, and then I'll report back my own results. And in this kind of virtuous cycle, um, there's this benefit to the participants for their contributions. And at the same time, it's feeding into um, to research data. So I won't cover. These, I think I'm just about out of time. Can I borrow three minutes for this quick participation task? Yeah? OK. So now that we know each other so well, I would like to ask you a question. Um, how many of you had a bowel movement today? <laughs> OK. If you, if you, OK, I appreciate your candor. How many of you don't want to participate in this? <laughs> few others. OK. So this is what I want you to do. Get out your smartphones. Get out your devices right now. You've got like one minute. OK? You're going to do this survey online. Those of you who participated already, feel free to participate again. Those of you who didn't want to. So here, here's a show of hands. How many of you are willing to participate in the online anonymous survey? A lot better. OK. Here's the URL. It'll take you 30 seconds to get there and 30 seconds to do it. I should have known that a group of medical people would raise their hands when I asked the question. <laughs> it's only fair. OK. Raise your hand when you're done. Still working on the survey. Okay. Ten more seconds. Okay. So I appreciate your participation in this study. Let's look at the results. Wow. Wow. Um, here we go. OK, that's test data back here. So we're, that's just response volume.
Sorry, I, this is my testing. Okay, so 34 people responded. 44% uh, said yes, and 55% said no. So this is what I would call cyber science. We collected data. Did you feel like you were doing science when you answered those questions? Not so much. Okay. <laughs> so then here's another question that you answered. Okay, what did you think about everyone else? Um, and you could only answer whether you thought that half of the respondents or more had had a BM today or not. And um, it looks like 67% thought yes and 32% thought no. So that's kind of interesting, right? Um, so this is what we would call wisdom of the crowds, or in this case, failed wisdom of the crowds. <laughs> okay, so this is a form of collective ignorance. Um, so now we can ask one more question, and then I promise I'll leave. What we're going to do is is we're going to ask a conditional question. Now this becomes sort of a behavioral study. Oh, come on, you didn't make me sign up last time. Oh. Uh, so the question we want to ask is, what is your answer to the next, to the second question conditional on your answer to the first question? So then it becomes a behavioral study, right? to say, depending on what you did this morning, how likely is that to influence what you think about what everyone else did? Um, so then my question to you is, before I ask that question, should I have gotten IRB approval? You know, because it's a behavioral study. Or at what point in this process should I have gotten an IRB approval? And am I in trouble with Sarah now, <laughs> who I met earlier, who's chair of the IRB? So. I'm sorry I couldn't provide the final results. Maybe it's better that I didn't, because then I won't get in trouble from the IRB. So thanks very much. Doesn't seem to work. Um, you talked. You talked a lot about sort of. I think a lot of your examples are, or are sort of related to the data space. But uh, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious to everyone in here that you know our ability and our citizens' ability to uh, you know to sort of discern between paths that are fruitful and paths that are not fruitful extends well beyond the data space to you know, the space of hypotheses we might ask, the study designs we might adopt, you know, what to do with data, uh, you know, what steps to take once a study is done. So I think we can, you know, we think about the broader sort of range of citizen science, you know, using people, not using, but, you know, to look at different paths that might be fruitful and, and, and less fruitful. Was that a question or a comment? Thank you.